I want to talk about uh, libertarianism and the alt-right or the alternative right and as a subtitle I have chosen in search of a libertarian strategy for social change. Um, we all know the fate of the term liberal and liberalism. It has been affixed to so many different people and different positions that it has lost all its meaning and become an empty, nondescript label. And the same fate, I fear, has now increasingly, also increasingly threatens the term libertarian and libertarianism that was invented to regain some of the conceptual precision that was lost with the demise of the terms liberal and liberalism. However, the history of modern libertarianism is still quite young. It began actually in Murray Rothbard's living room and found its first quasi-canonical expression in his book For a New Liberty, a Libertarian Manifesto. This was published in 1973. And it, the libertarian movement included initially no more than about 10 people fitting in Murray Murray Rothbard's living room. And because of the young, young age of libertarianism, I'm hopeful and not yet willing to give up um, the, the term as it has been defined and explained by Rothbard with unrivaled clarity and precision. Notwithstanding the meanwhile countless attempts of so-called libertarians to muddy the water and misappropriate a good name of libertarianism for something entirely different. The theoretical, irrefutable core of the libertarian doctrine is simple and straightforward and I have explained it already repeatedly at this place. If there were no scarcity in the world, human conflicts, or more precisely, physical clashes would be impossible. Interpersonal conflicts are always conflicts concerning scarce things. I want to do A with a given thing, and you want to do B with the very same thing. And because of such conflicts, and because we are able to communicate and argue with each other, we seek out norms of behavior with the purpose of avoiding these conflicts. The purpose of norms is conflict avoidance. If we did not want to avoid conflicts, the search for norms of conduct would be senseless. We would simply fight and struggle. Now, absent a perfect harmony of all interests, conflicts regarding scarce resources can only be avoided if all scarce resources are assigned as private, exclusive property to some specified individual or group of individuals. Only then can I act independently with my own things from you with your own things, without you and me physically clashing. But who owns what scarce resource as his private property and who does not? Now first, each person owns his physical body that only he and no one else controls directly. And second, as for scarce resources that can be controlled only indirectly, that must be appropriated with our own nature given that is unappropriated body, exclusive control or property is acquired by and assigned to that person who appropriated the resource in question first or who acquired it through voluntary and conflict-free exchange from its previous owner. Because only the first appropriator of a resource and all later owners connected to him through a chain of voluntary exchanges can possibly acquire and gain control over it without conflict, that is, peacefully. Otherwise, if exclusive control is assigned instead to latecomers, conflict 
is not avoided, but contrary to the very purpose of norms, made unavoidable and permanent. Now, before this audience, I do not need to go into greater detail except to add this. If you want to live in peace with other people and avoid all physical clashes, and if such clashes do occur, seek to resolve them peacefully, then you must be an anarchist or a proponent of a private law society, or more precisely, you must be a private property anarchist an anarcho-capitalist or, as I said, a proponent of a private law society. And by implication then, and again without much further ado, someone or anyone is not a libertarian or merely a fake libertarian who affirms and advocates one or more of the following things, for instance, the necessity of a state, any state, of public or state property, and of taxes in order to live in peace, or who affirms the existence and unjustifiability justifiability of any so-called human rights or civil rights other than private property rights, such as woman rights, gay rights, minority rights, the right not to be discriminated against, the right to free and unrestricted immigration, which is the right to free trespassing, uh, the right to a guaranteed minimum income or to free health care or the right to be free of unpleasant speech and thought. The proponents of any of this may call themselves whatever they want. And as libertarians, me, we may well cooperate with them insofar as such cooperation offers the promise of bringing us closer to our ultimate goal but they are not libertarians, or only fake libertarians. Now, a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. While Rosebart and I, following in his footsteps, never went astray from these theoretically derived core beliefs, not just non-libertarians, but in particular also fake libertarians, that is, people claiming falsely to be libertarians, and even many possibly honest yet dim-witted libertarians have selected and vilified us as their favorite bet noir and incarnates of evil. Rosebart, the spiritus rector of modern libertarianism, has been branded, for instance, by this so-called anti-fascist crowd as a reactionary, a racist, a sexist, an authoritarian, an elitist, a xenophobe, a fascist, and to top it all off, as a self-hating Jewish Nazi. <laughs> <coughs> and I have inherited all of these honorary titles, plus a few more, except for the Jewish stuff. <laughs> so what funny thing has happened here? Now trying to develop an answer to this question brings me the topic, to the topic of this speech, namely the relationship between libertarianism and the alternative right, or the alt-right, which has gained national and international notoriety after Hillary Clinton, during the last presidential election campaign, identified it as one of the inspirational sources behind the basket of deplorables rooting for Trump, and which, I must say and emphasize, which after Trump's election victory, the alternative right, quickly broke with Trump. At least most of the people broke with Trump when it turned out that he was just another presidential warmonger. Now, the alt-right movement is essentially the successor of the paleo-conservative movement that came to prominence in the early 1990s with columnist and best-selling author Patrick Buchanan as its best-known representative. It went somewhat dormant by the late 1990s, and it has recently, in light of the steadily growing damage done to America and its reputation by the successive Bush I, Clinton, Bush II, and Obama administration, it has re-emerged more vigorous than before under the new label of alt-right. 
Many of the leading lights associated with the alt-right have appeared here at our meetings in the course of the years. Paul Gottfried, who first coined the term, Peter Brimelow, Richard Lynn, Jared Taylor, John Derbyshire, Steve Seiler, and Richard Spencer. As well, Sean Gabb's name is occasionally associated with, and my name is also regularly mentioned in connection with the old right. And my work has also been linked also uh, with the closely related neo-reactionary movement inspired by Curtis Yarvin, who I also personally know, um, and who write, wrote under the uh, pen name Mencius Moldbug um, and his now defunct blog, Unqualified Reservations. In sum, these personal relations and associations have earned me several honorable mentions by America's most famous smear and defamation league, the Southern Poverty Law Center, which my good friend Tom DiLorenzo always refers to as a Soviet poverty lie center. <laughs> now, how about the relationship between libertarianism and the alt-right and my reasons for having invited leading representatives of the alt-right to meetings with libertarians? Libertarians are united by the irrefutable theoretical core beliefs mentioned at the outset. They are clear about the goal that they want to achieve. But the libertarian doctrine does not imply much, if anything, concerning these two following questions. First, how to maintain a libertarian order once you have achieved it, and more importantly, second, how to attain a libertarian order from a non-libertarian starting point, which requires, of course, on the one hand, that one must correctly describe the starting point, and secondly, one must correctly identify the obstacles posed in the way of one's libertarian ends by this very starting point. To answer these questions, in addition to theory, you also need some knowledge of human psychology and sociology, or at least a modicum of common sense. Yet many libertarians and fake libertarians are plain ignorant of human psychology and sociology, or even devoid of any common sense. They blindly accept against all empirical evidence an egalitarian blank slate view of human nature that is, that all people and all societies and all cultures are essentially equal and interchangeable. Now, while much of contemporary libertarianism then can be characterized as theory and theorists without psychology and sociology, much or even most of the old right can be described in contrast as psychology and sociology without any theory. The old writers are not united by a commonly held theory, and there exists nothing even faintly resembling a canonical text defining its meaning. Rather, the old right is essentially united in its description of the contemporary world, and in particular the US and the so-called Western world, and the identification and diagnosis of its social pathologies. In fact, it has been correctly noted that the old right is far more united by what it is against than what it is for. It is against, and indeed it hates with a passion, the elites in control of the state, the mainstream media and academia. And why? Because the state, the mainstream media and academia all promote social degeneracy and pathology. Thus, they promote, and the alt-right vigorously opposes, egalitarianism, affirmative action, or non-discrimination laws, multiculturalism, and free mass immigration as a means to bring about this multiculturalism. As well, the alt-right loses everything smacking of cultural Marxism or Gramsciism, named after Antonio Gramsci, the Italian communist, 
and they hate all political correctness and strategically wise, I think, it shrugs off without any apology whatsoever or accusations of being racist, sexist, elitist, supremacist, homophobe, xenophobe, and so on and so on. And the alt-right also laughs off as hopelessly naive the programmatic motto of so-called libertarians such as the students for liberty, which I have also termed the stupids for liberty, <laughs> And my young German friend, Andre Lichtschlag, has referred to them as the Liberalala Libertarians. And their motto of peace, love and liberty, which Lichtschlag appropriated, translated into German as Friede, Freude, Eierkuchen Libertarians. <laughs> Now, in stark contrast to this, all the writers insist that life is also about strife, hate, struggle and fight not just between individuals, but also among various groups of people acting in concert. Uh, millennial Vo, Vos, pen name, a guy whose actual name is Colin Robertson, has thus, I think, aptly summarized the alt-right, and I quote, equality is bullshit, hierarchy is essential, the races are different, the sexes are different, Morality matters and degeneracy is real. All cultures are not equal and we are not obligated to think that they are. Man is a fallen creature and there is more to life than hollow materialism. Finally, the white race, race matters and civilization is precious. This is the old right. End of quote. Now, absent any unifying theory, however, there is far less agreement among the alt-right about the goal that it ultimately wants to achieve. Many of its leading lights have distinctly libertarian leanings, most notably those that have come here, which of course was the reason for having them invited in the first place, even if they were not 100 percenters. And um, all alt-righters that have appeared here, for instance, have been familiar with Rothbard and his work. All the while, the most recent presidential candidate of the Libertarian Party in the United States had never even heard of Rothbard's name. And all of them, those that I had here, to the best of my knowledge, were outspoken supporters of Ron Paul during his primary campaign for the Republican Party's nomination as presidential candidate. All of them. All the while, many self-proclaimed libertarians attacked and tried to vilify Ron Paul for his supposedly, and you know already what is coming, racist views. However, several of the old rights leaders and many of its rank and file followers have also endorsed views that are incompatible with libertarianism. As Buchanan before and Trump now, They are adamant about complementing a policy of restrictive, highly selective and discriminating immigration, which is entirely compatible with libertarianism and its goal of freedom of association and the opposition to forced integration. Many of them propose to combine this policy with a strident policy of restricted trade, economic protectionism, protect and protective tariffs, which is, of course, antithetical to libertarianism and inimical to human prosperity. Let me hasten to add, however, here, that despite my misgivings about, about his economics, I still consider Pat Buchanan a great man. Others strayed even further afield, such as Richard Spencer who first popularized the term alt-right. In the meantime, owing to several recent publicity stunts, which have gained him some sort of notoriety in the US, Spencer has cl laid claim to the rank of the maximum leader of a supposedly mighty unified movement. An endeavor, by the way, that has been ridiculed by Taki Theodorakopoulos, Taki Mag, Uh, who is a veteran champion of the paleoconservative turned old right movement and was Spencer's former employer. 
When Spencer appeared here several years ago, he still exhibited strong libertarian leanings. Unfortunately, however, this has changed and Spencer now denounces without any qualification whatsoever all libertarians and everything libertarian and has gone so far as to even put up with socialism as long as it is socialism of and for only white people. You can imagine my disappointment. Now, given the lack of any theoretical foundation, this split of the alt-right movement into rival factions can hardly be considered a surprise. Yet this fact should not mislead one to dismiss it because the alt-right has brought out many insights that are of central importance in approaching an answer to the two questions that I mentioned before that libertarians had traditionally difficulties answering, namely of how to maintain a libertarian order and how to get to such an order from the current decidedly unlibertarian status quo. The alt-right, of course, did not discover these insights. They had been long, long before established and indeed in large parts they are no more than common sense. But in recent times, such insights have been buried under mountains of egalitarian leftist propaganda and the alt-right must be credited at least for having brought them back to light. To illustrate the importance of such insights, let me take the first unanswered question first. Many libertarians hold the view that all that is needed to maintain a libertarian social order is a strict enforcement of the non-aggression principle. Otherwise, as long as one abstains from aggression, according to their view, the principle of live and let live should hold. Yet surely, while this live and let live sounds appealing to adolescents in rebellion against parental authority and all social convention and control, and I should add, many youngsters have initially been attracted to libertarianism, believing that this live and let live is all that libertarianism has to offer. And while this principle does indeed hold and apply for people living far apart and dealing with each other only indirectly and from afar, when it comes to it does not hold, this principle does not hold and apply, or rather it is insufficient when it comes to people living in close, close proximity to each other as neighbors and cohabitants of the same community. A simple example suffices to make this point. Assume there's all of a sudden a new next door neighbor. This neighbor does not aggress against you or your property in any way but he is simply a bad neighbor. He is littering on his own neighboring property, turning it into a garbage heap, for instance. In the open, for you to see, he engages in ritual animal slaughter. Uh, or he turns his house into a Freuden house, a bordello, with clients coming and going all day and all night long or he never offers a helping hand and never keeps any promises that he has made, or he cannot or else he refuses to speak to you in your own language, and so forth and so forth. We all have experiences with what bad, how bad life can become if you have bad neighbors. So your life is turned into a nightmare yet you may not use violence against him because he has not aggressed against you. Now, what can you do? You can, of course, shun and ostracize him. But let's say your neighbor does not care. In any case, you alone, thus punishing him, makes little, if any, difference to him. You have to have the communal respect and authority or you must turn to someone who does have this com communal authority um, to persuade and convince everyone, or at least most of the members of your community, to do likewise. 
and make the bad neighbor a social outcast, so as to exert enough pressure on him to sell his property and leave. Now, so much for those libertarians who, in addition to their live and let live motto, also hail the ideal of uh, respect no authority, respect no hierarchy, respect no person above you. Now, the lesson, the peaceful cohabitation of neighbors and of people in regular direct contact with each other on some territory, that is, a tranquil, convivial social order, requires also a commonality of culture, of language, religion, custom, and convention. There can be peaceful coexistence of different cultures on distant, physically separated territories, but multiculturalism, cultur cultural heterogeneity, cannot exist in one and the same place and territory without leading to diminishing social trust, increased tension, and ultimately the call for a strong man and the destruction of anything resembling a libertarian social order. And moreover, just as a libertarian order must always be on guard against bad, even if non-aggressive neighbors by means of social ostracism, that is, by a common, you are not welcome here culture, so, and indeed even more vigilantly so, must it be guarded against neighbors who openly advocate communism, socialism, syndicalism, or democracy in any shape or form. These people, in thereby posing an open threat to all private property and property owners, must not only be shunned, but they must, to use a by now somewhat famous Hopper meme, be physically removed, <laughs> if, if need be by violence and forced to leave for other pastures. Not to do so inevitably leads to, well, communism, socialism, syndicalism, or democracy, and hence the very opposite of a social order that can call itself a libertarian. Now, while these rightists, or as I would say, plain commonsensical insights, with these in mind, I turn now to the more challenging question of how to move from here, that is, the status quo to there. And for this, it might be instructive to first briefly consider the answer given by the liberalala, peace and love and liberty, Friede, Freude, Eierkuchen, or capitalism is love libertarians. Because it reveals the same fundamental egalitarianism, even if in a slightly different form, as that exhibited also by the live and let live libertarians. These these live and let live libertarians, as I have just tried to show, define what we may call the bad neighbor problem and what is in fact of course merely a shorthand for the general problem posed by the coexistence of distinctly different, alien, mutually disturbing, annoying, strange or hostile cultures. They have simply defined this problem out of existence. Um, because they assume all people are exactly the same, all cultures are the same, and if that is true, then a bad neighbor problem simply cannot exist. Now, these same egalitarian, or as the liberal -la libertarians themselves to prefer call themselves, humanitarian spirit also comes to bear in their answer to the question of a libertarian strategy. In a nutshell, what they advise is this, be nice, talk to everyone, and then in the long run, the better libertarian arguments will win out. To illustrate, take my former friend turned into a foe, Jeffrey Tucker, who gives us five don'ts when talking liberty. And I quote, they are, first, don't be belligerent. Second, don't presume hatred of liberty. Three, don't presume different goals. And four, don't presume ignorance. And five, don't regard anyone as an enemy. Those are the four don'ts. Now, quite apart from the fact that Tucker 
does not seem to follow his own advice in his belligerent condemnation of the entire old right as liberty-hating fascists, I find his exhortations truly astounding. They may be good advice vis-a-vis -vis people who have just sprung up from nowhere without any traceable history whatsoever, but vis-a-vis -vis real people with a recorded history, they strike me as hopelessly naive, unrealistic, and out outright counterproductive. Counterproductive in the pursuit of libertarian ends. For I, and I assume everyone else here, know of and have had met many people in my life who are ignorant, who do have different unlibertarian goals, and who do hate liberty as understood by libertarians. And why in the world should I not regard such people as fools or enemies? And why should I not hate and not be belligerent vis-a-vis -vis my enemies? As a libertarian strategy then, I think Tecker's advice must be considered simply a bad joke. But surely it is good advice if one seeks entry into the state as some sort of libertarian state advisor. And this may well explain the enthusiasm with which Tucker's humanitarian libertarianism has been embraced by the entire liberal libertarian crowd. Now, outside, libertarian, outside egalitarian fantasy lands, however, in the real world, libertarians must above all be realistic and recognize from the outset, as the old right does, the inequality not just of individuals but also of different cultures as an ineradicable datum of the human existence. We must further recognize that there exist plenty of enemies of liberty as defined by libertarianism and that they, not we, are in charge of worldly affairs that in many parts of the contemporary world, their control of the populace is so complete that the idea of liberty and of a libertarian social order are practically unheard of or considered unthinkable, except as some idle intellectual play or mental gymnastics by a few exotic individuals. And that it is essentially only in the West that is, in the countries of Western and Central Europe and the lands settled by its people, that the idea of liberty is so deeply rooted that these enemies still can be openly challenged. And confining our strategic considerations now only to the West then, we can identify pretty much as the old right has effectively done these actors and agencies as our principal enemies. They are, first and foremost, the ruling elites in control of the state apparatus, and in particular, the so-called deep state, or the so-called cathedral of the military, the secret services, the central banks, and the supreme courts, as well, they include the leaders of the military industrial complex, that is, of nominally private firms that owe their very existence to the state as the exclusive or dominant buyer of their products. And they also include the leaders of the big commercial banks, which owe their privilege of creating money and credit out of thin air to the existence of the central bank and its role as the lender of last resort. They together, that is state, big business, and big banking, form an extremely powerful, even if tiny, mutual admiration society, jointly ripping off the huge mass of taxpayers and living it up big time at their expense. The second, much larger group of enemies is made up of the intellectuals, the educators and educrats from the highest level of academia down to the level of elementary schools and kindergartens. Funded almost exclusively, whether directly or indirectly by the state, they, in their overwhelming majority, have become the soft tools and willing executioners in the hands of the ruling elite and its designs for absolute power and total control. And certainly, there are the journalists of the mainstream media as the docile products of the system of public education and the craven recipients and popularizers of government information. Now, equally important 
in the development of a libertarian strategy then is the immediately following next question, who are the victims? Now the standard libertarian answer to this is the taxpayers as opposed to the tax consumers. Yet while this is essentially correct, it is at best only part of the answer. And libertarians could learn something in this respect from the old right. Because apart from the narrowly economic aspect, there is also a wider cultural aspect that must be taken into account in identifying the victims. In order to expand and increase its power, the ruling elites have been conducting for many decades what Pat Buchanan has identified as a systematic culture war aimed at the transvaluation of all values and the destruction of all natural or, if you will, organic social bonds and institutions such as families, communities, ethnic groups and genealogically related nations so as to create inherently an increasingly atomized populace whose only shared characteristic and unifying bond is its common existential dependency on the state. The first step in this direction, taken already more than half a century ago or even longer ago, was the introduction of public welfare and social security. Thereby, the underclass and the elderly were tur turned into state dependence and the value and the importance of family and community was correspondingly diminished and weakened. More recently, further reaching steps in this direction have proliferated. A new victimology has been proclaimed and promoted. Women, and in particular single mothers, blacks, browns, Latinos, homosexuals, lesbians, bi and transsexuals have been awarded victim status and accorded legal privileges through non-discrimination or affirmative action decrees. As well, most recently such privileges have been expanded also to foreign national immigrants, whether legal or illegal, insofar as they fall into one of the just mentioned categories, or are members of non-Christian religions such as Islam, for instance. The result, not only has the earlier mentioned bad neighbor problem not been avoided or solved, but it has been systematically promoted and intensified instead. Cultural homogeneity has been destroyed and the freedom of association and the voluntary physical segregation and separation of different people, communities, cultures and traditions has been replaced by an all-pervasive system of forced social integration. Moreover, each mentioned victim group has thus been pitted against every other, and all of them have been pitted, been pitted against white heterosexual Christian males, and in particular those married and with children as the only remaining legally unprotected group of alleged victimizers. Hence, as a result of the transvaluation of all values promoted by the ruling elites, the world has been literally turned upside down. The institution of a family household with father, mother and their children that has formed the basis of Western civilization as the freest, most industrious, ingenious and all around accomplished civilization known to mankind, that is the very institution and people that has done most good in human history, therefore done many bad things, that group has been officially stigmatized and vilified as the source of all social ills and made the most heavily disadvantaged, even persecuted group by the enemy elite's relentless policy of DVD at impera. Now, accordingly, given the present constellation of affairs, then any promising libertarian strategy must very much as the old rise has recognized, first and foremost be tailored and addressed to this group of the most severely victimized people. White married Christian couples with children, in particular if they belong also to the class of taxpayers rather than tax consumers and everyone most closely resembling or aspiring to this standard form of social order and organization can be realistically expected to be the most receptive audience for the libertarian message. 
whereas the least support should be expected to come from the most highly protected groups such as, for instance, single black Muslim mothers on welfare. Now, given this constellation of perpetrators or enemies versus victims in the contemporary West, then I can now come to the final task of trying to outline a realistic libertarian strategy for social change. The specifics of which, I'll come to that in a second, should be prefaced by two general considerations. For one, given that the class of intellectuals from the tops of academia down to the opinion-molding journalists in the mainstream media and so forth are funded by and firmly tied into the ruling system, that is, that they are part of the problem, they also should not be expected to play a major, if any, role in the problem's solution. Accordingly, the so-called Hayekian strategy for social change that envisions the spread of correct libertarian ideas starting at the top with the leading philosophers and then trickling down from there to journalists and finally to the great unwashed masses must be considered fundamentally unrealistic. Instead, any realistic libertarian strategy for change must be a populist strategy. That is, libertarians must short circuit the dominant intellectual elites and address the masses directly to arouse their indignation and contempt for the ruling elites. And secondly, all the while, all the, while the main addressees of a populist libertarian message must be indeed the just mentioned group of dispossessed and disenfranchised native whites, I believe it to be a serious strategic error to make whiteness the exclusive criterion on which to base one's strategic decision as some strands of the old right have suggested to do, wrongly so, I believe. After all, it is above all white men that make up the ruling elite and that have foisted the current mess upon us. True enough, the various protected minorities mentioned before take full advantage of the legal privileges that they have been accorded and they have become increasingly emboldened to ask for ever more protection. But none of them, and all of them together, did not and do not possess the intellectual prowess that would have made this outcome possible if it were not for the instrumental help that they received and are receiving from white men. Now, taking our cues from the Buchanan the Ron Paul and the Trump movement onto the specifics of a populist strategy for libertarian change. In no particular order, except for the very first one, which has currently assumed the greatest urgency in the public mind. One, stop mass immigration. The waves of immigrants currently flooding, flooding the Western world have burdened it with hordes of welfare parasites, brought in terrorists, increased crime, led to the proliferation of no-go areas and resulted in countless bad neighbors who, based on their alien upbringing, culture and tradition, lack any understanding and appreciation of liberty and are bound to become mindless future supporters of welfare statism. No one is against immigration and immigrants per se, but immigration must be by invitation only. All immigrants must be productive people and hence be barred from all domestic welfare payments. To ensure this, they or their inviting party must place a bond with a community in which they are to settle and which is to be forfeited and lead to the immigrant's deportation should he ever become a public burden. As well, every immigrant inviting party or employer should not only pay for the immigrant's upkeep or salary, but must also pay the residential community for the additional wear and tear of its public facilities that is associated with the immigrant's presence so as to avoid the socialization of any and all costs incurred with his settlement. Moreover, 
even before the admission, every potential immigrant invitee must be carefully screened and tested not only for his productivity, but also for cultural affinity or good labor needness with the empirically predictable result of mostly, but, no means, but by no means exclusively, Western white immigrant candidates. And any known communist or socialist of any color, denomination or country of origin must be barred from permanent settlement, unless that is the community where he, the potential immigrant wants to settle officially sanctions the looting of its residence property by new foreign arrivals, which is not very likely, to say the least, even with already existing commie communities. Now, a brief message to all open border and liberalala libertarians, who will surely label this, you guessed it, as fascist. Now, in a fully privatized libertarian social order, there exists no such thing as a right to free immigration. Private property implies borders and the owner's right to exclude at will. And public property has borders as well. It is not unowned property. It is the property of domestic taxpayers and most definitely not the property of foreigners. And while it is true, that the state is a criminal organization and that to entrust it with a task of border control will inevitably result in numerous injustices to both domestic residents and foreigners. It is also true that the state does something when it decides not to do anything about border control. And that under the present circumstances, if the state would not do anything about border control, um, that this will lead to even more and much graver injustices, in particular to the domestic citizenry, than any other policy. Two, stop attacking, killing and bombing people in foreign countries. A main cause, even if by no means the only one, of the current invasion of Western countries by hordes of alien immigrants are the wars initiated and conducted in the Middle East and elsewhere by the United States, ruling elites and their subordinate Western puppet elites. As well, the by now seemingly normal and ubiquitous terrorist attacks in the name of Islam across the Western world are in large measure a blowback of these wars and the ensuing chaos throughout the Middle East and Northern Africa. There should be no hesitation on our part to call these Western rulers responsible forces for what they really are, murderers or accessories to mass murder. We must demand and cry out loud instead for a foreign policy of strict non-interventionism. Withdraw from all international and supranational organizations such as the United Nations, NATO and the, United, and the European Union that intricate one country into the domestic affairs of another. Stop all government to government aid and prohibit all weapon sales to foreign states. Let it be America first, England first, Germany first, Italy first, Turkey first and smaller Bavaria first uh, and uh, uh, Veneto first and so forth. Um, each country trading with one another and no one interfering in anyone, anyone else's domestic affairs. Three, defund the ruling elites and its intellectual bodyguards. Expose and widely publicize the lavish salaries, perks, pensions, side deals, bribes and hush monies received by the ruling elites by the higher ups in government and governmental bureaucracies of Supreme Courts, central banks, secret services and spy agencies, by politicians, parliamentarians, party leaders, political advisors and consultants, by crony capitalists, public educrats, university presidents, provosts and academic stars. Drive home the point that all of their shining glory and luxury is funded by money extorted from taxpayers and consequently urge that any and all taxes be slashed. Income taxes, property taxes, sales taxes, inheritance taxes and on and on. 
Four, end the Fed and all central banks. The second source of funding for the ruling elites, besides the money extorted from the public in the form of taxes, comes from the central banks. Central banks are allowed to create paper money out of thin air. This reduces the purchasing power of money and destroys the savings of average people. It does not and cannot make society as a whole richer, but it redistributes income and wealth within society. The earliest receiver of the newly created money that is usually the ruling elites are thereby made richer and the later and latest receiver that is the average citizen are made poorer. The central bank's manipulation of interest rates is the cause of boom-bust cycles. The central bank permits the accumulation of ever greater public debt that is shifted as a burden onto unknown future taxpayers or is simply inflated away. And as a facilitator of public debt, the central banks are also the facilitators of wars. This monstrosity must end and be replaced by a system of free, competitive banking built on the foundation of a genuine commodity money such as gold and silver. Five, abolish all affirmative action and non-discrimination laws and regulations. All such edicts are blatant violations of the principle of the equality before the law that at least in the West is intuitively sensed and recognized and as a fundamental principle of justice. As private property owners, people must be free to associate or disassociate with others, to include or to exclude, to integrate or to segregate, to join or to separate, to unify and incorporate, or to disunite, exit, and secede. Close all university departments for black, Latino, women, gender, queer studies, and so forth, as incompatible with science, and dismiss its faculties as intellectual imposters or scoundrels. As well, demand that all affirmative action commissars, diversity and human resource officers from universities on down to schools and kindergartens be thrown out onto the street and be forced to learn some useful trade. Six, crush the anti-fascist mob. The transvaluation of all values throughout the West, the invention of ever more victim groups, the spread of affirmative action programs and the relentless promotion of political correctness has led to the rise of an anti-fascist mob. Tacitly supported and indirectly funded by the ruling elites, this self-described mob of social justice warriors has taken upon itself the task of escalating the fight against white privilege through deliberate acts of terror directed against anyone and anything deemed racist, right-wing, fascist, reactionary, incorrigible, or unreconstructed. Such enemies of progress are physically assaulted by the anti-fascist mob, their cars are burned down, their properties are vandalized, and their employers are threatened to dismiss them and ruin their careers. All the while, the police are ordered by the powers that be to stand down and not to investigate the crimes committed or persecute and punish the criminals. In view of this outrage, public anger must be aroused and there must be clamoring far and wide for the police to be unleashed and this mob beaten into submission. Now, a query again for liberalala libertarians and the stupids for liberty who are sure to object to this demand on the ground that the police asked to crush the anti-fascist mob are state police. Question to them, do you also object on the same grounds that the police arrest murderers or rapists? Aren't these legitimate tasks performed also in a libertarian order by private police? And if the police are not allowed to do anything about this mob, isn't it okay then that the target of these attacks, namely the so-called racist right, should take the task upon itself and of giving the social justice warriors a bloody nose? Seven, crush the street criminals and gangs. 
in dispensing with the principle of the equality before the law and awarding all sorts of group privileges except to the one group that I mentioned, the ruling elites have also dispensed with the principle of equal punishment for equal crime. Some state favored groups are handed more lenient punishment for the same crime than others. And some especially favored groups are simply let run wild and go practically unpunished at all, thus actually and effectively promoting crime. As well, no-go areas have been permitted to develop where any effort at law enforcement has essentially ceased to exist and where violent thugs and street gangs have taken over. In view of this, public furor must be provoked and it be unmistakably demanded that the police crack down quick and hard on any robber, mugger, rapist and murderer and ruthlessly clear all current no-go areas of violent gang rule. Needless to say that this policy should be colorblind, but if it happens to be, as it in fact is, that most street criminals or gang members are young black or Latino males or in Europe, young immigrant males from Africa, the Middle East, the Balkans or Eastern Europe, then so be it. And such human specimen then should be the ones that most prominently get their noses bloodied. And needless to say also that in order to defend against crime, whether ordinary street crime or acts of terrorism, all prohibitions against the ownership of guns by upstanding citizens should be abolished. Eight, get rid of all welfare parasites and bums. To cement their own position, the ruling class has put the underclass on the dole and thus made it the most reliable source of public support. Allegedly to help people rise and move up from the underclass to become self-supporting actors, the real and actually intended effect of the state's so-called social policy is the exact opposite. It has rendered a person's underclass status more permanent and made the underclass permanently grow. And with this, of course, also the number of tax-funded social workers and therapists assigned to help and assist this group. For in accordance with, exact, with exact economic law, every subsidy awarded on account of some alleged need or deficiency produces more, not less, of the problem that it is supposed to alleviate or eliminate. Thus, the root cause of a person's underclass status, that is, his low impulse control and high time preference, that is, his uncontrolled desire for immediate gratification and the various attendant manifestations of this cause, such as permanent unemployment, poverty, alcoholism, drug abuse, domestic violence, divorce, female-headed households, out-of-wedlock births, rotating checked up male companions, child abuse, negligence and petty crime is and are not alleviated or eliminated, but systematically strengthened and promoted. Instead of continuing and expanding the increasingly unsightly social disaster, it should be abolished and be loudly demanded that one takes heed of the biblical exhortation that he who can but will not work also shall not eat, and that he who truly cannot work due to severe mental or physical deficiencies be taken care of by family, community and voluntary charity. Nine, get the state out of education. Most, if not all, social pathologies plaguing the contemporary West have their common root in the institution of public education. When the first steps were taken, well more than 200 years ago in Prussia, to supplement and ultimately replace a formerly completely private system of education with a universal system of compulsory public education, the time spent in state-run schools did, in most cases, not exceed four years. Today, throughout the entire Western world, the time spent in institutions of public education is, at a minimum, around 10 years, in many cases, and increasingly so, 20 or even 30 years.
That is a large or even the largest part of time during the most formative period in a person's life is sp spent in state-funded and state-supervised institutions, whose primary purpose from the very beginning it was not to raise an enlightened public, but to train good soldiers and later on good public servants, not independent and mature mündige Bürger, but subordinate and servile Staatsbürger. The result? The indoctrination has worked. The longer the time a person has spent within the system of public education, the more he is committed to leftist egalitarian ideas and has swallowed and wholeheartedly internalized the official doctrine and agenda of political correctness. Indeed, in particular among social science teachers and professors, people not counting themselves as part of the left have practically ceased to exist. Consequently, it must be demanded that the control of schools and universities be wrested away from the central government and in the first step be returned to regional or better still local and locally funded authorities and ultimately be completely privatized so as, to, so as to replace a system of compulsory uniformity and conformity with a system of decentralized education that reflects the natural variation, multiplicity and diversity of human talents and interest. And ten and last, don't put your trust in politics and political parties. Just as academia and the academic world cannot be expected to play any significant role in a libertarian strategy for social change, so with politics and political parties. After all, it is the ultimate goal of libertarianism to put an end to all politics, to, inter to subject all interpersonal relations and conflicts to private law and civil law procedures. To be sure, under present all pervasively politicized conditions and involvement in politics and party politics cannot be entirely avoided. However, any such involvement, in any such involvement one must be keenly aware of and guard against the corrupting influence of power and the lure of money and perks that comes with it. And to minimize the risk and temptation that comes from this, it is advisable to concentrate one's effort on the level of regional and local rather than national politics, and they are to promote a radical agenda of decentralization, of nullification and peaceful separation, segregation and secession. Most importantly, however, we must take heed of Ludwig von Mises' life motto, do not give in to evil, but proceed ever more boldly against it. That is, we must speak out whenever and wherever, whether in formal or in informal in gatherings, against anyone affronting us with the by now only all too familiar political correct drivel and left egalitarian balderdash and unmistakably say, no, hell no, you must be kidding. And in the meantime, Given the almost complete mind control exercised by the ruling elites, academia and the mainstream media, it already acquires a good portion of courage to do that. But if we are not brave enough to do so now and thus set an example for others to follow, matters will become increasingly worse and more dangerous in the future and we and Western civilization and the Western ideas of freedom and liberty will be wiped out and vanish. Thank you very much. <laughs>